County Courthouse. This is it. I'm glad this is over with. Yes, sir. Ooh, what a fight. What a fight. I've been a public defender at Legal Aid Society since 2002. I can't tell you how many times my clients did not believe me when I said, well, I actually don't have the evidence. Especially when... You're my lawyer. Right, you're my lawyer. What do, you, what do you mean? That can't be right. Yeah. But because New York State's discovery laws are so antiquated, so broken, so unfair, that following the laws are actually creating really a, a situation of injustice. Our state's current discovery laws were amended in 1979 to protect witnesses in criminal cases. New York is one of 10 states where prosecutors may withhold witness statements and police reports from criminal defense attorneys until the day of the trial, a period that can last years, essentially blindfolding defendants to evidence and even who's accusing them, a practice the New York State Bar Association characterized as outdated and unfair. So I'll give you an example of a client uh, that this affected, and that's uh, Terrence Wilkerson. Uh, he uh, was uh, prosecuted in the Bronx, uh, one of five people charged with robbery. Um, and for two years, he went back and forth to court fighting his case. He was offered a plea. He said, no, I didn't do this. Hey, my name is Terrence Wilkerson. Born in New York, raised in the Bronx. Currently still reside in the Bronx, South Bronx area. You know, that's where the crime happened at, I suppose. This, this is what happened at this grocery store over here. But yeah, I remember being in my brother-in-law's apartment. You know, we was hanging out. So I said, let me run to the store. So I went outside to go to the store, but the store was closed. It's just a window area with a, the window revolved. So I remember standing there, but I, I felt like a lot of crowd was behind me. So I turned around and it was a bunch of police. I realized it was police there. So I, I said to myself, uh, nothing to do with me. Let me get back in the house. So I skipped up the stairs and got back in my building. I think it was like five, six minutes later, the door kicked in. And just boom, it was a boom. I lift my head up. And it's an officer come right in, and he says, what's your name? And I says, for what? What are you even doing in here? And he says, okay. And he come towards me and grab me by my arm and bring me outside to the front of the stoop of my building. The next thing you know, I was preparing to go to court. So I was charged with, I believe, first degree armed robbery, second degree robbery, grand larceny, possession of a weapon, Mr. Wilkerson was arrested May 13th, 2015. We received this document when we got sent out to trial in September of 2016. In this document, it says that the complaining witness noticed that there was a phone number on the phone that had been taken from him by the real perpetrators. The prosecution thought its best evidence was a number dialed from the cell phone stolen from the complaining witness at the bodega. The problem, as records would show, was when the calls to that number had occurred. We were able to figure out that the phone number belonged to an escort, and that escort was advertising on Backpage. And we were able to get all of the uh, documentation as to that to show that this complaining witness knew whose phone number that belonged to. This complaining witness had called that phone number previously this complaining witness had called other escorts previously. Um, and since he was robbed by this person, he happened to keep calling that number. More than, say, I think 32 times he called that number in just the month after he says he was robbed. Wow. The evidence that was withheld, a phone number, a phone number. They withheld this for a year and a half. They then had this, a phone number that, that, that proves that it wasn't me. It was someone else, or it wasn't even anyone. But a whole year and a half later, that's when they decided to give up a phone number. It made me feel like uh, 
my life don't matter, uh, my, my opinion don't matter, my innocence don't matter, and you have the proof that a person is innocent and still don't give that up to attorneys is not right. We were able to investigate this, and thank goodness, because we came back with a not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And the jury, the jury loved Terrence. They stayed afterwards. They all waited for him. They all wanted their picture taken with him. They hugged him. All of these people who were so, I think, incensed by what happened here, but also just so moved by somebody standing up and saying, I didn't do this. Going through the process, you know, yeah, that was, that was very hard, very hard for me and my family. Going back and forth, up and down these blocks, back and forth to court, that was very hard. So looking at New York State, I saw a number that 98% of the felony convictions that happen are, are based not on trial, but people taking the plea. If we were to have this open discovery process, what do you imagine that number would look like? It would certainly go down. The difference is they're going to plea guilty knowing that the evidence might have been stacked against them, that the deal that was put on the table in relation to the evidence against them was fair. Um, and so it's a fairer knowing process, whereas right now, you're blindfolded. So cast the villain for us. Who's the enemy of reform standing at the state house door saying no? So, um, you know, discovery reform, bail reform, and speedy trial reform were in the budget package that the governor put forth. The Senate didn't even come to the table, didn't include any of that in the one house. We're hoping that that will change now during legislative session. Until that happens, what's the real human cost? It's injustice. Every single moment we don't do this is another moment somebody's taking a plea blindfolded.